Good morning and a big welcome to all attendees to this webinar on the subject of electricity trading and virtual wheeling to industrial, business, small, medium and micro enterprises, and even residential customers. My name is Chris Yelland, and I'm the Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence, and I'll be your host and moderator at this webinar, signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome also to all our presenters, all of whom will be introduced to you in due course. And of course, a big welcome to you, the attendees, for your interest and participation. We have 1,630 delegates registered to attend this webinar today uh, to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject. This attests to the relevance of the subject matter being covered and to the stature of the presenters and their companies. May I express a big thanks to the sponsors of this webinar, that is Discovery Green and Mezzanine, and also to the presenters for their participation and the time and effort that they've put in. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download the presentations will be made available shortly to all those who registered to attend, as well as publicly. While the presentation is in progress, please do send your questions on the Q&A text chat facility, sorry, on the text facility and not on the chat facility. You may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally. So we have set aside about 30 minutes after your presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of the questions. This webinar is in fact a follow-up on the first webinar that we held on electricity trading that was hosted by EE Business Intelligence on the 17th of August, 2023. At this first webinar, Annika Rantwane, the Senior Advisor for Electricity Pricing at Eskom, introduced Eskom's new virtual wheeling and trading framework and Eskom's own plans in this field. We also heard from a number of traders and their platforms for electricity trading, including the Independent Energy Pool, Africa Green Co., the Energy Exchange of Southern Africa, and PowerX. At this webinar, we got to hear about the solutions planned by Discovery Green to achieve a high renewable energy percentage for its customers at a cost saving, whilst leveraging the risk mitigation benefits of a diversified platform. Thereafter, we will hear how virtual wheeling is changing the game and how Mezzanine has developed a digital platform enabling virtual wheeling across Eskom and municipal networks to thousands of Vodacom towers and facilities throughout South Africa. Thereafter, we'll hear from Jan Uberholzer, the former Eskom COO and the new chairman of Mulilo Energy on how renewable energy is expanded through electricity trading that goes beyond one-to-one -one wheeling to reach multiple customers embedded in both Eskom and municipal networks. And then finally, my friend, colleague, and business associate, Lindsay Dyer of Sixth Wave Africa, will summarize and give her own insights on what has been presented. And this will be then followed by a 30-minute Q&A session moderated by Lindsay and myself. So without further ado, may I introduce you to our first presenter, Andre Nepgen. Andre is an actuary and executive associate to the group chief executive at Discovery. He heads up Discovery Green, a new renewable energy platform that connects businesses across South Africa to affordable and renewable energy generated by utility scale renewable power plants. Previously, as head of the Global Vitality Network, Andre led the central development of platform assets for the Global Vitality Network, including global partnerships, behavioral programs, brand initiatives, vitality data assets, and the extension of the Vitality Shared Value Model 
to new markets and industries. Andre has an honors degree in business and actuarial sciences from the University of Cape Town. Andre, it's a great pleasure to have you uh, speaking to us today, and I'd like to now hand over to you uh, to start your presentation. Thank you, Chris, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a great privilege to, to speak here. I think we always uh, watch these and never thought we'd actually present at them, so, so thank you, Chris. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a great privilege to introduce uh, or talk, to, talk about Discovery Green uh, here today, I think. We all agree that um, we have anticipated uh, to talk about renewable energy or energy um, uh, and discovery in the same in the same sentence. But but here we are, and we're very excited uh, to talk to you about our approach here. Um, I thought it would be, you know, in, instead of of showing the details of specifically how Discovery Green works, I, I thought it would be good to to highlight, you know, a little bit of our journey. As, as how we got to to this place and how we entered into the market and uh, and why we believe we have a, a role to play to to support the development of the renewable market and and uh, uh, stimulate a lot more renewable energy generation um and it's a slightly different journey and I think maybe that perspective is is very valuable um to this market because we we're approaching it as both a a client who has looked at this market extensively, um, and as someone who is dealing with the needs of businesses all over the over the country, um, also very excited uh, with my uh, co-speakers here today, Jan and, and Jock. Thank you very much. I'm excited to hear your your talks as well. So let me begin um, quickly by just telling you a little bit around around the history and and how we got to this point and how how Discovery has entered the renewable energy space. I mean, it um, it already started. Um, for us as a group, uh, we've been working on this for, uh, for almost half a decade now, but um, but the focus and the origins has really been around emissions um, and how do we get uh, ourselves as a group uh, down to carbon neutrality. It started out, of course, in, in classic discovery fashion with a goal of being carbon neutral by 2025. Uh, and then as a, as a deeper dive into the actual technical ways in which to get to that low uh, footprint, uh, the the solution sort of came uh, apparent. Currently, as you look at our emissions profile as a, as a corporate, and we're quite low when compared to other companies in the industry, just given given the nature of our business. But the source of our our emissions uh, as a corporate are ninety two percent electricity, which means you now one is it's it's both a massive opportunity to change that, but two, it's a, a big dependency on on your source of electricity generation. Um, and that started off a, a very long process of deep dives into the market, the market dynamics, the offers, the products that are currently out there. And we quickly learned that that we had a role to play in this. Now, the reason this percentage is, is a 92% um, is, is very simple. And I think we all know this well, but we don't actually know how severe it actually is. South Africa has by far the dirtiest electricity in the world. Uh, we've been we've held this position for a few years now. Um, it's, it's about twice the global median. Um, and this is, you know, this is important. I mean, it's a, it's a consequence of our history, and, and that's all fine. But it, it's an opportunity and a risk to us. One, it's a, it's an opportunity in that there's a considerable opportunity for investment to a renewable energy transition. But importantly, I think it's a, it's a risk to businesses out there, given that the impact of emissions and the impact of of carbon uh, uh, is is becoming a bigger bigger role in actual business operations whether or not it's import tax or export tax or um ESG ratings uh, shareholder pressure consumer pressure these are all factors that are that are playing a big big role now although it is it is very very dirty we're all fully aware that that unfortunately we do not have enough of that uh, enough electricity generation in South Africa and what we found and and this is, and, and I'm quoting ESCOM here, but the gap that we need to fill as a as an industry is absolutely substantial. Now, to me, and for discover from Discovery's point of view, this is a bit of a perfect perfect storm in that we need to decrease uh, or improve our, our carbon footprint as a as a country, uh, and you know we're going to have an accelerated development of renewable energy to support that transition. Um, and this and this is uh, and this is this is very exciting. Um, and and we'll we'll keep a good eye on, on where this goes, but as corporates and business in South Africa, what we found is is when we started speaking to our closest partners and a lot of companies in the industry, is that this whole concept of 
scope two emissions, emissions from electricity generation, making up the majority of your total sort of carbon neutral goal. It's it's a similar story for absolutely every corporate out there, with the exclusion of mines and industrials and smelters who, who have a, a slightly different profile. Uh, scope two makes up the majority for for absolutely um, absolutely everyone, and uh, and the antidote or the anti the the solution that has been available to companies like ourselves up to this point has been on site rooftop generation. Uh, now it's a it's some some have been very successful in that, but what we have found is that the majority of companies, the ones that we deal with, uh, it's a it's a drop in the ocean in terms of the impact that it can actually have. So, you know, to give you an example, the building. Uh, I'm sitting in right now one discovery place. Uh, our roof is full of solar solar panels, yet it's only um, reducing our energy demand by three percent on an annual basis. This is unfortunate. Uh, it's a step in the right direction and should should be encouraged. But uh, I think we all agree, and and this is the journey that Discovery went on, that the antidote to this is is of course renewable energy wheeling. Uh, and we see a massive opportunity there to support the national system, support it. And, and we think it's a, it makes complete sense. South Africa has some of the best solar radiation in, in the world. I think uh, we have twice that of Europe um, per meter squared, which is incredibly appealing, uh, I think, from a renewable profile and, and very attractive wind resources as well. Uh, and if we could leverage building at scale, um, and connected national grid. I think there's a there's an opportunity both from a, a business side in terms of uh, of more affordable clean energy, but also from a national side in making a small dent or making inroads into into addressing load shedding. So we believe, and this is the journey that we've gone on as Discovery uh, to to move towards uh, renewable renewable energy. So we launched um, about a month ago, uh, Discovery Green. Uh, it is our renewable, it's Discovery's renewable energy platform sitting in between large-scale renewable energy generation and a diverse set of businesses across different industries and geographies and of different sizes on the other side. And the intention is is simple. The offer is actually quite simple. It's it's affordable renewable energy, affordable in the sense that uh, that we believe we can provide it at a substantial discount to what is currently available uh, in the market. Uh, it is renewable in the sense that we believe that it is needs to be and has to be green. Um, we've taken we've taken a view that uh, that we will not separate out any other renewable credits or characteristics of this power given that um, it, it it supports the the transition in, in terms of reducing corporate emissions and, and we we um, we don't want any double counting. It's price certain, of course, in the sense that um, that it provides CPI level protection, uh, and we all know, uh, unfortunately, over the last few years, electricity prices have been increasing at roughly CPI plus eight, and this is, I think, a very very important characteristic in terms of budgeting and planning for businesses. If we build enough of this, we believe that we could at least contribute to the national shortfall or be be a uh, a, a player in the market on on one of them addressing it. And lastly, and this is a big part of our focus as well, is we believe that business should be focused on their business um, and there needs to be a big role, a big play in making the the onboarding journey for business in South Africa quite seamless uh, so that long-term contract negotiations um, is, a, is a thing of the past and business can procure energy with enough confidence and trust in the system um, that uh, that it is is done quickly, and I think it's an important characteristic because uh, it allows for the faster building and construction of of good generation assets. So, in a nutshell, that is that is what we what we're doing from from a platform point of view. I'd like to talk to you a little bit around our journey um, to to uh, renewable energy wheeling and why we believe that Discovery has a role to play as a a middleman. Um, between between this. Um, and, and it comes down to the simple fact, and I think everyone knows this very, very well, is that renewable energy is is variable in its nature. Um, you know, we all we all model on what is called P50s or best estimates and, and then apply a simple distribution around that to determine what is the the likelihoods of different things. But in its very nature, it is it is completely variable. Um, and even though there's smoothing mechanisms in place, um, businesses run the risk that their consumption and their generation is at a mismatch, and uh, we think this is this has been managed well in the industry. But I think for to really rapidly scale generation 
to get the majority of businesses close to 100%, uh, running on 100% of renewable energy. The current model out there that is that is being offered by the market is not necessarily the right one. And uh, let me explain to you why that is the case. So uh, the current model, and uh, um, you might have might have seen it in different forms, but uh, we like to call it the share of plant model. And it's a it's a very very clever approach to it. We we believe it was originally uh, you know designed as part of the the reap structure and for incredibly large off takers such as such as the mines or the smelters, but. But the concept is is fairly straightforward in that um, your businesses consume as they wish and a, a certain generation profile or share of plant is procured that is less than the actual consumption of the business. And because of that gap between your actual consumption and the generation profile that you see there, the variability in generation is largely handled on that. And of course, the, the generation is cheaper than the current rates and it's a certain percentage renewable. So you actually achieve a good outcome in that a certain percentage of your energy is renewable and you're saving you're saving money. We see this as a as a good interim solution, but we we are nervous about the ability for companies to to progress. And this is definitely just the uh, this is this is more the the companies that we talk talking to on a regular basis. In that it's not a it's not a necessarily a journey towards renewable energy, given the urgency to compete international, given the urgency of meeting your carbon neutrality goals, given the urgency of, uh, of supporting load shedding, we must build as much as possible and we need to get as close to actual consumption as we can. Now, the problem with this model, and, and it's it's a problem when it, when it gets to closer to the consumption line, is that the more slices you add on or the better the, the plant actually performs, which is supposed to be a very, very good thing, you know, good wind and good sun is, is very good for for the industry um, on that is that you get to a point where you quickly start generating these yellow spots on the graph here where generation is an excess of consumption. Um, and our view, you know, and our understanding is of course the the in order to to make sure that these plants are are funded and you know the returns are made um and, and the debt is repaid to whoever ever built these plants, um, you know, the the companies are required to pay for what is generated even though there's a mismatch to its actual consumption. So what happens is these yellow parts generally cost you 10 times more than the savings you get on the green parts and all your savings absolutely disappear. So while this could be managed by a sophisticated team of engineers for a particular company with a large amount of offtake, for the majority of companies out there, you know, managing this on a regular basis or understanding this or trading this out is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, and we see this as a bit of a hurdle for generation assets to be built at the maximum that they can be built at. Because, um, you know, from a risk point of view, a company would rather choose a low percentage than than take on this risk. And we think it's a it's a lost lost opportunity. Of course, if you want to go 100%, um, you are going to pay considerably more than what you actually uh, need, uh, and there's going to be considerable wastage. Um, and and uh, and this is a, a risk that we see. Uh, or see playing out. The way we've approached it is a little bit different, uh, and our view is this is more of a of a mathematical problem than it is a, a as an energy problem. And, and hence, you can see discovery's role in this. We we believe that with enough diversification on the consumption side, combined with good diversification on the generation side, uh, combined with some some modeling in the middle, we are able to get to a point where you can offer companies a very high percentage of renewable energy without the risk of paying for generation that they don't consume. And I think that's a fundamental thing that that companies are worried about because companies are looking at ways to make their consumption more efficient. Companies are worried about um, you know, entering into contracts with that risk and hence not buying as much as they should. We think it's absolutely critical to unlock this market to give companies the comfort that they won't pay for generation that they don't consume. In addition to that, the, the whole diversification model and the whole platform model itself uh, removes a considerable amount of risk away from businesses that would have usually been passed on because the platform can take that on and the platform can diversify that. And if you have a strong enough entity in the middle, these risks can actually be absorbed and managed as opposed to to shared with clients, making the the buy decision, I think, so much easier. So um, so this is this has sort of been our, our approach and our, our solution to this. I'd like to give you a very practical example, a very, very simple example of how this how this plays out. Um, uh, we use this example just given our 
our partners that we that we deal with. Uh, if you had to consider, for example, the white line, there's a is a gym consumption. You can see the two peaks happening uh, early in the morning and and uh, in the evening. And you overlay sort of a solar generation profile without batteries uh, attached to this. What you can see, it, it's it's uh, it's a terrible mismatch on this. So, um, you know, and it, it's, it's also seasonal as well. So you can imagine the mismatch being even greater. You know, it's just much higher in, in January and a lot less in, in later parts of the year. But the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, for a, for a profile like this, a corporate like this, you know, renewable energy purchasing on a share of plant approach is very, very difficult to do. Um, you know, especially from a solar point of view, if you were to diversify on the generation side, and I give you just here a practical example, if you had to combine wind to this profile, you can immediately see how you are able to um, fill in a lot more of that line, get a lot more green. Um, but you're still generating a substantial amount of yellow, which is a uh, generation that you don't consume. And I think this is a risk, you know, that that makes the buying decision for, for a market player yeah, very, very difficult to do. Our approach really is to say, listen, if you have enough industries, if you have enough individual companies with diversification in their consumption, you can do something completely different. So just using one particular company, and I'm going to use a pharmacy in this instance, you know, and, and they actually a good antidote to this particular profile, and you add a pharmacy onto this, you're able to see how you can quickly um, remove a lot more of that yellow part in a very, very simple way, in a simple sense to explain it, that diversification on consumption is, is how we remove the risk and how we allow companies uh, to procure a lot more generation than, than what they've had before. And you can imagine what two companies do, imagine what 30 or 40 different industries and players can achieve in different regions of the country. And we've modeled this out quite extensively, and we believe that it's a, a di generation diversification is, is absolutely critical um, to achieving uh, a market whereby people are not buying 40, 50, 60%, but as close to 100% as possible of, of renewable energy generation. Another example I'd like to use, and I'd like to mention you, yeah, I mean, the the, the classic example that we, we use is, um, you know, manufacturing. The manufacturing industry is, is very much a middle of January to the start of December. A good counter correlation to that really is, is the leisure or hotel industry who uses a considerable more, a greater amount of energy in, in December and the first few months of January. So you can see how there's a, a, a diversification benefit, almost a, a symbiotic relationship between these different industries which allows you to achieve the diversification you need um, to meet the renewable generation profile. And this is the, the place that uh, we believe that the discovery can play a role, can add some benefit to the industry, can unlock more off takers um, to procure energy, allow us to build a greater amount of renewable energy generation, which we're very excited about. Um, uh, and it allowed us to, I think target not share a share of plant approach, but very much a energy as a platform approach or energy as a product approach. The the difference is that that we're not targeting uh, giving you a certain slice of generation and whatever that plant produces you have to take, but we're actually saying we are going to target a certain percentage of your consumption. And I think that fundamentally different approach is 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 better for corporate South Africa. It's better for business South Africa to understand in that you know, you consume as you need to, and we're going to target a certain percentage using the platform and the assets that we have. Um, I won't go into the product details, but we focus on two very fundamentally different, uh, and fundament similar products, but uh, serving two different needs for companies. The first is um, relieving some of the cost pressure currently undergoing by companies and the increases being currently seen. A product focusing at achieving a very large percentage of renewable energy penetration, within a particular company while maximizing the financial savings to them. Uh, and that's sort of our first product. The second product, and this is one we're quite excited about and and uh, and uh, is unfortunately a limited availability of this product, but it's one that actually guarantees companies 100% of their energy consumption for any given month, for any given time of use, for any given site. Um, and of course, this is not not available to everyone, and, and depends on the, on the company and and how much of this product is still available. But we believe that there's a number of industries out there where renewable energy, whether or not they're multinationals or they have international investors, there's top down pressure to say, listen, you need to run on 100% renewable energy, or we're reconsidering our investment, or um, we we've made this commitment and we need to achieve it as a as a corporate. 
So, so we believe that there's a product for these companies out there that that allows them to to actually contract for that security and that and that guarantee, um, which which I think is is quite unique. The last point I'm going to make, and and I'm nearing sort of the the end of my time, is is a question we often get, and I think uh, I think it's good for the industry um, to to understand this, and and I think we we big uh, promoters of this is is the question we often get is is people the People think, you know, there's there's been a long narrative around renewable energy costs coming down. I think between round five and round six, we've seen a bit of a, a change in that direction. But a question companies often ask is is a bit of a wait and see approach, and and we actually think the the opposite is the answer today. The the opposite for a number of reasons. One, of course, is is grid access, but the second one I think is is the financial argument around opportunity costs. We believe corporate South Africa, the time is now. Um, to procure renewable energy because uh, it being cheaper than the current rates, because there's a saving that can be generated now, and because of that price certainty that you currently get uh, with that CPI hedge, whatever you get today, the savings will most definitely outweigh any potential price drops that might happen uh, in the future. And we've modeled it quite extensively and, and a bit of rule of thumb. You need the, the overall price of renewable energy to drop by over 20% for every five years delay. And we believe, you know, a future of of those sort of decreases is is quite unlikely. So, we're advocating really for for companies in South Africa, and we're promoting it strongly on our side uh, to get involved in the renewable energy side to stimulate the market because it's a, a market that will really benefit from scale and urgency and getting things done. And and we're quite excited about that. Uh, the last point that I'm going to make is is one thing we focus on a lot, and I mentioned it earlier, is around the onboarding process. Um, we've all, I think, uh, if you've been in, involved in this industry and, and you've seen how this uh, this played out, um, time is and time frames are, are usually quite long, and your ability to bring those time frames down um, has enormous benefits. Benefits to lenders, benefits to IPPs and their sponsors in terms of generation. It is, it has got a, enormous benefits in terms of of creating certainty in prices without having to go back and forth in in, in renegotiations and. And changes in prices. So we spent a lot of time building a platform that allows companies um, to uh, to get to a quote in hand and a quote signed and a contract in hand in less than a week. And I think that's an important process that we want to get to in terms of encouraging companies to think of energy as a product, energy as any other contract that you sign as a corporate, um, that there's enough trust in the system, there's enough good brands in the system. And hopefully, Discovery can add to that, um, that that creates a, a market of trust that people are willing and quick to make decisions, to make decisions in a short time frame, so that so that the industry can get going with the construction part. Um, so Chris and the team and everyone, thank you for listening. I, I really um, appreciate the time and, and it's wonderful to be here um, and, uh, and look forward to answering some questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andre, for this uh, presentation and for the insights on this new business that you've established. You know, it wasn't long ago that we held our first webinar on electricity trading, and uh, and and uh, we involved a number of traders that were active at that time, and uh, and suddenly, uh, you know, a discovery uh, a green emerged uh, on the scene, as it were. And it's really interesting to see how a company, uh, you know, which is really a financial services business uh, that's involved with uh, pension schemes and medical aid schemes and banking and insurance uh, has now gone into energy. But as, you, as you've said, this is not about energy generation and pipes and machinery and overhead lines and that. It's really a financial transaction uh, and the skills involved um, are not uh, engineering skills, but uh, financial and actuarial skills. Uh, and, and so it's really fascinating to see uh, how, uh, how Discovery has, uh, ha has risen to, to this challenge, and we watch with the greatest of interest. So thank you very much uh, again um, uh, for that, Andre. And uh, it's really now my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, 
uh, and that is Jacques de Foss. Uh, he's the CEO of Mezzanine, uh, which is a Vodacrom group company. So uh, just to recap, um, Jacques de Foss is the CEO and the founder of Mezzanine. It's now a subsidiary of Vodacom Group. So at one point, I guess it was acquired. Uh, he leads this ever-growing organization in delivering digital transformation across the African continent, where more than 25 mezzanine projects are currently active in 12 African countries. His vision for the company is to establish a platform and business with a unique insight and track record in the agricultural, healthcare, education, social services, and now also in the energy and electricity environments. Thus, uh, assisting enterprises and individuals in benefiting from the digital dividend throughout Africa. So Jacques has a Master of Science degree in Biomedical Engineering from Stellenbosch University. And uh, it's a great privilege also to have you with us today. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing about the case study that you are going to present and how how Mezzanine uh, has actually led the way together with Vodacom and ASCOM in developing this uh, virtual uh, wheeling uh, concept, uh, which he's going to explain, I'm sure, in, in a lot more detail than I will be able to. So uh, thanks, Jacques, and over to you for your presentation now. Thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, that was quite a mouthful um, as an introduction. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I just want to, to I've, I've changed my title a bit to note that it's got the potential to be a game changer. Just noting that we are still in the process of, of validating this mechanism working with, with ESCOM and, and Vodacom. So I think just before I start, credit to, to ESCOM and Vodacom for, for um, the work they've done towards developing this mechanism. Um, I'll use the, the work we're currently supporting uh, in, in, as I said, validating the mechanism to just illustrate the benefits, but then also highlight very important what are the outstanding items that need to be addressed in order for this really to, to be material uh, with respect to our current energy situation. So just to quickly start with, you've noted uh, Mezzanine. I think for a lot of people, it might not be a known a known brand. Um, as you've noted, it's it's part of the Vodacom family uh, for the last 10 years. And our, our mandate is really both exploratory mandate in looking at leveraging the, the benefit of mobile and digital in, in delivering value to our customers across our footprint markets. Uh, but also very specifically looking at partnering with government and uh, large corporates in introducing new services and products, um, specifically focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa. Just one item to note, um, our function is also as mezzanine aggregation function, which means that the offering is, is, is network or what is often referred to as carrier agnostic. It just means it's not limited to a Vodacom uh, IoT capability or mobile subscriber sim uh, being in the phone of, of the beneficiary or the user. The benefit can be used and enjoyed across third-party network, hence our ability to support both on and off footprint markets. <clears throat> so I think just a bit of context and background with respect to, I refer to it as a journey, um, as a proxy for, I think, a journey that a lot of uh, corporates, not only in South Africa, but globally uh, have, have commenced on with respect to um, sustainable source of, of renewable energy. Um, uh, and in case of Vodacom, that's 100% ambition uh, across their, their footprint. Um, on the left-hand side on the map, you'll note the black dots is the, is the Vodacom base station. So they've got more than... 15,000 buy stations across South Africa, which very much follow the, the, the citizen uh, coverage and uh, across the different um, uh, provinces um, overlaid with our solar uh, resource in South Africa. So you'll note here that in Gauteng, in the urban areas, you've got a high density of, of towers. Um, also, of course, Vodacom campuses, data centers. Whereas the resource that reside on the left-hand side, um, uh, Northern Cape, um, 
towards towards the west. Um, so in in our ambition or in Vidacom's ambition towards net zero, I mean, of course we've investigated the means to generate on site. So similar to what Andre shared earlier, um, our ability to do embedded on site generation. But you will appreciate for a base station, you don't have uh, enough real estate to put it down sufficient solar and or wind capacity or generation capacity to serve the purpose of, of keeping that base station up and running. So I've noted here on the right hand side, the consumption profile um, and Andre did share a number of, uh, for the gym and different pharmacy. For Telco, it's a 24 hour profile uh, being quite uh, across the 24 hour cycle, more or less uh, the same. But if you overlay that with the, the solar resource in green, of course that is only during daytime hours. So the design requirements with respect to moving towards net zero was very important to support multiple IPPs. I think Andre, this is a point you also made. It can't just be solar, you need a mix of solar and wind and potential other generation means um, in order to map that 24 hour requirement to keep your data centers and, and your uh, buy stations up and running. And then very interestingly, the, the the fourth item, which I think a lot of credit to Vidacom leadership from the, from the uh, initiating this discussion with ESCOM, the task was guys, this need to be something that can work for all corporates. So this is about rising the tide. It's not only solving for Vidacom net zero ambition, but can we develop a means that will allow other corporates um, with a similar distrib distributed consumption base um, to also benefit uh, from, from, that, uh, from the capability that, that we develop. So it need to be agnostic and very important, it need to be uh, non-exclusive. Now, I'm not gonna go into the detail of the additional wheeling. I think it's been around for many years as a ESCOM policy. And for majority of, of corporates in South Africa, it does contribute to a percentage of, of, their, uh, of their goal um, with respect to moving to net zero. But not because it's limited to mostly your high voltage, medium voltage consumers. So these are your mining companies, your smelters that's direct, directly linked to ESCOM transmission or distribution capability. This mechanism will only allow you to recover a percentage of, of your demand. Um, so in the case of Vodacom, if you look at the, the, the consumption and the demand, it's about 20% uh, uh, ESCOM, 80% uh, on a Munich level. And traditional wheeling, one of the limitations is that in order for you to use this mechanism, which by the way is, is a credit mechanism, where ESCOM credit the buyer for the, the wheeled energy purchased from the IPP, the Munich, the municipality also need to be a party to that agreement. <laughs> now, in the case of Vodacom, they, on a monthly basis, they buy electricity from 168 municipalities. So I think conceptually, to think you're going to do a credit reconciliation across 168 municipalities was never really a consideration. So I think the, the initial thinking in our engagements, which is about 15 months ago with ESCOM was, can we use the same principles that, that ESCOM support under traditional wheeling and extend it to allow buyers that's got a demand, energy demand within Munich to also wheel energy from private generated um, uh, providers. So I think traditional wheeling is almost the foundation of the concept that was then introduced as virtual wheeling. Um, now, just to note, virtual wheeling has, has been approved as a, as, as a ESCOM policy, um, but as I've noted earlier, we are now in the process of validating the processes, the systems in enabling this policy and enabling ESCOM to contract this mechanism to uh, private buyers. Now, just the terminology that I'll use you can interchange the word buyer with trader. I think there's no distinction from a policy point of view. Um, but the key focus and, and criteria was how do we allow Munich's, uh, how do we bring Munich's municipalities into play? 
Um, as I've noted earlier, in the case of Vodacom, it's only 20% that's ESCOM connected uh, off takers or sites. Uh, 80% reside within municipalities. So this was a key ask, but then also the second related ask was without disrupting business as usual. So taking into account all the regulatory frameworks, the requirements, the current status of a lot of the municipalities from a credit risk point of view, can we develop a mechanism that allow the buyer to continue on a business as usual basis to, to buy energy from municipalities and to pay them as per the standard uh, 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 arrangement? Um, and then re do a reconciliation on an ESCOM level. So to allow a decentralized consumption of energy, but a reconciliation on, on an ESCOM level, on a transmission level, that then allow the buyer that's got a consumption demand within a Munich or multiple Munichs to enter into a, a, a PPA with an IPP or multiple IPPs and then wheel that energy to both ESCOM sites and then uh, Munich sites. So this request was submitted to, to ESCOM um, by, by Vodacom. And over the last uh, 12 to 15 months, we've been co-creating this mechanism, which we now refer to as, as, as virtual wheeling. Now, the, the business rules, and I won't go into the detail, but a couple of business rules worth noting is that ESCOM said immediately, business rule number one, your generation can never be more than consumption on a time of use basis. So we are not the battery, we can't store your energy or excess energy. So your consumption across all your offtake sites need always on a time of use basis need to be more than generation. The first one. Second one, the refund, while it was a credit mechanism under traditional wheeling, is now a refund on overpayment. Acknowledging that the buyer pay, pay, pay both the IPP as per the uh, uh, PPA agreement and the Munich as per their standard electricity supply agreement. So there was an overpayment by the buyer and ESCOM will refund that overpayment to the buyer. For the municipalities, that is in good standing. In other words, for the municipalities where ESCOM received payment, from the municipality where the buyer is consuming uh, energy. And this introduced the mini credit risk issue, which I think is one of the key issues that, that need to be addressed. So consumption, so generation, never more than consumption, the Munich non-payment risk, time of use basis, and then lastly, it's a monthly reconciliation. So although there's a real-time visibility on what is generated on a half an hour basis and what is consumed, the time of use the reconciliation will be done on a monthly basis and the refund will then be paid by ESCOM to the buyer for either what was wheeled, the wheel energy, so the generated energy, or what is consumed, the lower of the two values. Again, acknowledging that consumption of generation should never be more, more than consumption. So where we are, we're busy validating uh, using uh, a plant in uh, um, in Midrand uh, at the Vodacom campus, um, and we wheel energy to about 740 towers at the moment. You will note there that the generation in the middle top block um, is, is a lot lower, less than 10% of, of demand, of consumption. Um, all of these sites are ESCOM connected, so there's no uh, um, credit risk with respect to non-payment by Munich. Um, and again, our consumption is, is, is about 10 times generation, so there's no risk of over-generating. Now, what is important to note is the calculation is time of use specific. So your off-peak, peak and standard uh, calculations are uh, reconciled uh, as separate line items and the repayment is calculated per time of use uh, period. So this is, uh, let's call it the ideal scenario. Um, if we move to simulated data or dummy data to just illustrate the risk of um, both the Munich risk uh, and, and over-generating is, 
You will note here that the total generation um, is about two point, almost 2.4 megs. Consumption is, is 2.7. So on face value, say consumption is more than generation. So I'm good with, a, with, a, a, with about a 400 uh, uh, gap. But because of the Munich risk, the eligible kilowatt hours is only 1.2 megawatt, uh, uh, megawatt hours. So in this case, when we do calculate the refund, in, the buyer will not uh, receive a refund for a fairly big percentage of energy that was consumed uh, uh, for the specific month. This was for the month of, of August. Uh, so just illustrating, and again, the, this is now simulated data, but looking at the mix of Munich, which is your gray sites, and ESCOM connected sites, which is your blue sites, um, and then within Munich, you've got a split between ESCOM approved as per the Munich uh, uh, credit in good standing definition, and then 56% that's not in good standing. In other words, that the refund are not eligible for. And this will be done on a month to month basis. So again, just random data, the green or uh, Munich that's in good standing, amber is not in good standing. So again, you will only be able to recover a percentage of your consumption uh, against this mechanism. So the, the point that Andre made earlier that on, in principle, until, until we've solved the Munich risk issue, credit risk issue, a buyer will not be able to recover 100% of demand through a virtual wheeling mechanism. In other words, a buyer will not be able to get to a net zero position through a virtual wheeling mechanism alone, but we'll need a combination of mechanisms, embedded, traditional, and virtual, in order to get to a net zero uh, position. Um, and then I've got, <coughs> with the remaining time, and I want to honor Jan's slot, so I won't take more than the 20 minutes, but just quickly a snapshot on the contractual framework, because I think a lot of the questions that, that was um, uh, shared when ESCOM uh, made this public was around the contracting mechanism. So a buyer will enter into a virtual wheeling agreement with ESCOM. Uh, there is a pro forma version of this agreement available uh, um, through ESCOM. Um, business as usual, no changes to the electricity supply agreement between both ESCOM and municipalities and then between the buyer and municipalities. And I think this is a key take out is that it's business as usual on a Munich level. And this is also from a Munich point of view, a uh, consideration to use virtual wheeling to compete with what is currently eating into their revenue uh, on the embedded generation side. So in the case of virtual wheeling, the Munich will still fulfill the role of distributing the electron uh, to the buyer side. And the Munich will be able to recover that, that, that charge from, from the buyer. Then business as usual, connection agreement between IPs, ESCOM remain unchanged. So these are the gray blocks. Buyer entry into a power purchase agreement with their choice of IPPs. And this can be, as I mentioned, one or many. And the new contracts will then be the blue blocks. So signing a virtual wheeling agreement with ESCOM um, and then signing a agreement contract F on this view with a provider uh, of, of a virtual wheeling platform that allow the buyer to meet the contractual obligations as stipulated in the virtual agreement signed between the buyer and ESCOM. So the, the role of the virtual wheeling platform, um, and again, I've mentioned the fact that it's non-exclusive. I believe there should be many of these platforms in future enabling the buyer to meet the contractual obligations with respect to getting their refund at, at the end of the month. And then just very important, last but not least, contract G, a buyer will be able to appoint a smart vendor of their choice. So again, the requirement to have real-time visibility on both generation consumption, uh, a buyer will be able to appoint any vendor that support the ESCOM accredited uh, um, SANS 474 certified meter, and that data will be eligible uh, for a refund calculation. Again, 
give, uh, provided that it meets the 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 ESCOM certification requirements. So I think that the from a contractual point of view, business as usual with the Munich, um, business as usual between the IPPs and ESCOM, business as usual between ESCOM and Munich, which is a big win. The addition is the blue blocks of enabling the buyer to now move private generated electrons from their selection of IPPs to both their direct, their local and, and non-local sites. So in closing, I think if we look at the value drivers um, that, that that virtual wheeling unlock as a mechanism, um, I don't think it's a it's a matter of moving value value from one stakeholder to another. Um, across the ecosystem of stakeholders, virtual wheeling will enable all parties to participate in, in let's refer to it as a future-proof energy value chain. And very important on the right-hand side, municipalities we see as a key stakeholder, and we hope and we believe that municipalities ultimately will also contract this mechanism with ESCOM in order to offer their tenants a green credential as part of a monthly utility bill. So we very much <clears throat> see Munich as, as, a, as a key stakeholder in ensuring that this mechanism is, is used at scale and contracted at scale. And then just to close with, um, within our team, Marius is, is leading our effort on, on virtual wheeling. So any questions um, with respect to where we are with validation, lessons learned, key insights, uh, please reach out uh, to Marius. Chris, and with that, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jacques. And uh, it really sort of cements my view about how, you know, the old world of power generation as we knew it, uh, coal and uh, nuclear and hydro uh, and machines and things like that, um, hardware, is uh, digitizing. <laughs> the whole process of electricity supply now, the digitization process, the software and IT aspects of optimizing uh, assets uh, and uh, making a better use of them uh, in a way that uh, helps uh, keep the price of electricity down and uh, drives cleaner, uh, greener energy going forward. Uh, becomes apparent, and 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 I can see this now. How how IT is starting to play such an important role, and a company like Mezzanine, which is uh, really a an IT uh, platform developer and solution provider, is playing such a critical role. The other thing that came to my mind as you were talking about how this is so customer driven. I suppose to find a suitable IPP is not that difficult. You know, you go out to tender, you you get prices, people submit their uh, their offers. But the key is to develop a whole uh, diversified basket of off takers or customers, uh, and and so this uh, is ultimately <clears throat> very much a customer driven uh, initiative, uh, which is the way I think it should be. So uh, having said that, thank you very much indeed uh, to you, Jacques, for those insights and for the incredible work that you are doing. And I would like now to uh, introduce our final uh, presenter, uh, and that is Jan Oberholzer, the chairman of Murillo Energy. So, you know, well, Jan Oberholzer is a very well-known figure in South Africa. And I must tell you that I think that he is one of the most upright straight up and down electrical engineers that I have ever known. Um, he's had a long, lifelong career of service at ESCOM, uh, most recently as the group chief operating officer, tasked with leading the operations of ESCOM generation, transmission and distribution, nuclear, capital expansion, ROTEC industries, risk and sustainability, and research, testing, and development. So after leaving Eskom at the end of April 2023, Jan was appointed chairman of Molilo, in which capacity he's going to be speaking to us today. Jan holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Pretoria, a master's degree in business leadership from the University of South Africa, and he completed an executive leadership program at the University of Michigan in the USA. 
So again, with great pleasure, may I hand over to you, Jan, uh, to give your presentation. Thank you. Morning, Chris, and uh, morning to all connected. Uh, yeah, at least uh, now that I'm with Melina as chairman, I'm I'm at least busy. So, Chris, it's quite a quite a change for me. Um, and again, thanks for the opportunity to share some of um, Malilo's views on how do we see, you know, the role of traders in South Africa uh, in this environment moving forward. What I'd like to do is just to give an overview of Malilo. So Malilo Energy Holdings is a PTY limited company, and it's uh, been and it is a leading South African renewable energy developer, or so to speak, an independent Power producer. Now, Melilla was established uh, way back in 2008. Um, and at the time, you know, and, and I think up until very recently, it was the only South African independent power producer company. So currently, Melilla, and if we look at, uh, you know, the map on the right hand side, it holds 420 megawatts of gross operational assets um, currently. And uh, then they also have a gross capacity of 410 megawatts. So those are basically those uh, dots A, B, C, and D, 410, with they have PPAs. And then more, I believe for me, what is, I wouldn't say more important, but very important is that we do have a pipeline of projects in excess of 30 gigawatts. Now, and also uh, quite an aggressive target for the team uh, that in the next five years or so that we would like to uh, at least be busy with construction of five gigawatts. Now, I was listening to Andre earlier talking about, uh, you know, the need in South Africa, and I've been vocal about it for, for quite some time, of additional capacity that is required in the country, anything between 50 and 60 gigawatts. If you look at ESCOM's 2035, uh, when I was still there, uh, you know, a generation plan, uh, quite a few uh, of the power stations, specifically the units, will come to end of life. And that means that we have to make it up with a hybrid solution of which, obviously, the green energy will play a significant role moving forward. And we as Melillo are quite uh, excited to be part of the solution dealing with uh, the challenges that we have in South Africa and provide a sustainable solution. Now, I believe it's important to, this slide is actually extremely important. Now, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, or called CIP, they're in Denmark, they acquired in July, a few months ago, a significant uh, shelding, the majority shelding within Melilla. Now, CIP is a global leader. It's the largest investor, actually, in the renewable energy investments. Uh, and they make significant and meaningful contributions uh, to the green transition. Now, if we say then a global leader, what does it mean? Now, currently they have, it's a little bit more than 25 billion euros of assets under management, so across 11 funds that they have They're in the process now to, to finalize another fund, which is a significant fund. Now, what is critical and, and important to understand that in excess of 90 gigawatts, they're busy with in excess of 90 gigawatts of green fuel projects in the world. So in development currently and under construction and operation already 11 gigawatts. In terms of uh, the ESG, the Environmental, Social and Governance, uh, they have a dark green fund under the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. And their contribution is a reduction of approximately 10 million tons of CO2 emissions per annum, uh, significant. And obviously they have very aggressive targets to, to increase that. Now, what is also important is they innovate and an industry pioneer. They've been one of the first movers to on offshore wind, as well as, you know, the power to X. Now, power to X, for those of you perhaps not familiar, it's how you take electrons, electricity, and you turn it into carbon neutral synthetic fuels. They also, um, in, you know, they have a presence basically worldwide. They have uh, in all the all the key markets. They have nine offices across Europe, USA, and APEC, and now they have a presence in South Africa as well with a 
office, head office of Melillo down in Cape Town. And what is also for me critical and very important of CIP, they're not just a group of investors. They have a large, diverse skill set within themselves that uh, can provide the uh, the value that is required. Now let's unpack the 35, or, yeah, it's about 35, just under 35 gigawatts of pipeline. And I'd like you just to concentrate here on the orange squares. So those are the pipeline for solar PV projects uh, that is uh, in the pipeline. If you look then at the blue squares, that is the wind projects. And then if you look at the square with the, with the green as well as the orange inside, those are you know the solar PV as well as best projects. And if you, you break it down between the wind and the solar, you can see approximately a little bit more than seven gigawatts. It's actually a little bit more, but let's make it eight, seven, eight gigawatts of uh, wind projects and then an excess of 23 uh, solar and also a little bit of base inside the battery energy storage systems. Now, key power purchase agreements. What is important for an IPP when you think about a PPA? Now, there are various options that uh, is available uh, to find off-takers for the electrons that the IPP basically is generating. Now, it's a one-to-one, -one, the typical one-to-one, -one where you have a, a special purpose vehicle in whatever form, generating the electrons. And it's to get it then to the customers, you know, that's uh, through a, you know, a PPP, a PPA contract, that's a typical wheeling, you know, agreement. Or it may be from that same vehicle to many customers. You can, for this uh, example, you can use a medium-sized customer. So we have multiple PPAs from this uh, special purpose vehicle. Or then you can have the one-to-one -to, -one to many, and that's where the trader is coming in. So where this vehicle generating the electrons got a PPA with the trader, and the trader then ha you know, has all these uh, agreements and uh, power purchase agreements with a multiple uh, number of, uh, of customers. Now, what are... You know, we've been 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 talking about it, and 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 really, <laughs> what is what is critical? What uh, what benefits does a trader bring to an IPP like Melina? Now, number one, you know, it is additional small customers. So what 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 it is all about is the trader allows an IPP to effectively sell the electrons to many small customers. And this is then for the trader, not, not necessary to have a huge sales force to go and allocate and sign up those con customers themselves. So it, it really brings, uh, you know, this effectiveness uh, into, into the picture. Then it's also for, you know, the IPP then to get access to Munich customers. Now, what is important to understand that an IPP needs a long-term, very well-structured PPA in order to obtain low cost debt funding. And this is what the trader assists with. So the trader can contract then additional contracts, our customers, I apologize, who may be looking for short-term, more flexible PPAs, but there is still a PPA between the IPP as well and, and the trader that is long-term that can assist with the low cost debt funding. It is also assisting in terms of risk uh, mitigation. Where an IPP customer defaults, the IPP then know that there are traders in the market. We can quickly act as you know typical buyers of last resort, and this obviously gives the IPP lenders, you know, those people with the bags of money, the comfort that the IPP won't default on the loan. You know, even if the IPP customer at the end is in default. Now, what are those key considerations for an IPP contracting with a trader? Now, there are some challenges that needs to be overcome before you know uh, you will sign uh, you know this contract with with a trader. So, first of all, it is the bankability of the trader, and there are two issues in terms of that. Uh, it is for can the trade trader provide short term 
payment support. So this would typically be in terms of a letter of credit from a bank, which is typically about three, three months of revenue. But then also importantly, can the trader provide long-term termination support? So if the trader defaults on a PPA, that probably means that the tra trader is, uh, is in a bankrupt uh, position. And then the IPP, what is critical, needs resources to the parent, a recourse to the parent company, that in this event that there is the necessary security to ensure that the, PP, uh, the IPP can still service the debt that they do have. Also then, what is important is the ability of the trader to find uh, customers. Now, typically, the, it takes some time and, and, and it's quite a long cycle between the IPP signing the PPA with the trader um, and the IPP project being completed, as well as the projects reading, uh, reaching financial closure. Now, for an IPP, it is important then that it wants to partner with a trader who they are confident that can actually find those customers, you know, that they have generated for usage. And then thirdly is a PPA, you know, this power purchase agreement structure with the trader. Now, it is important to understand that an IPP wants the trader to be the source of the payment under this power purchase agreement. So it's important to understand the trader to be the source of the payment under the power purchase agreement. And then also important is the IPP don't want to have to look to the end user as it adds additional risks and complexity to this power purchase agreement. So these are some of the important aspects that needs to be considered when an IPP is contracting with a trader. Now, Melino, within Melilo, we do have a strategy in terms, uh, or we call it an offtake strategy that is part of our business. And so what we will do is we will sell power to traders where it makes sense and where it's necessary to be part of our broad customer base. So it may be, again, our special purpose vehicle, vehicle whatever form it, uh, it, 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 it consists of, perhaps to sell to Eskom. It may also be this uh, a vehicle, that uh, a project that will sell to perhaps a large customer. It may be that uh, this vehicle may sell to a number of customers. Or then the trader comes in that the, the special purpose vehicle will sell to a specific trader uh, or perhaps to more than one trader. So from a Melilo point of view, this definitely is part of our off tech strategy and which we are currently following. So we, we're currently evaluating some projects and some tenders. That is typically uh, what, we, what we see in front of us that we evaluate which is best and what makes sense in order to, to run your business. Now, Chris, uh, I haven't I've decided to, to just uh, have these few slides. Um, and so I'd like to thank you and for all that is basically listening today for your presence and for having for me having the opportunity to share what I've just shared with yourself. So thank you for that. And again, thank you, uh, Jan, indeed, for those perspectives coming from more from the view of the IPP and what it means to be an IPP that is a supplier to the trader uh, and uh, the risks to an IPP and what does an IPP have to, uh, the kind of relationship that it requires from a trader and what is needed from the trader itself. And I, I found your presentation to be really crystal clear on, on, on these issues. And um, I really appreciate uh, your insights and how fascinating it is uh, that the CEO, oh, the former COO of Eskom, uh, steeped in traditional power generation uh, and transmission and distribution is uh, has moved uh, to a new world uh, and is is uh, now truly forward looking uh, it's really important that we should be forward looking 
uh, looking towards the digitization of the uh, electricity sector, uh, looking uh, you know to the kind of financial transactions uh, and, and the actuarial aspects uh, of, of these arrangements. Uh, and and I, I've kind of seen that our three presenters today have each brought their own unique, uh, you know, experiences, uh, uh, you know, to the table. And I, it has certainly given me a much greater and clearer understanding of how this works and the role of the different players, whether they are IPPs, um, uh, like uh, Mulilo and, and many others, no doubt, um, whether they are the uh, trader or the intermediary uh, and, and, and uh, uh, and, and the, the, like uh, like um, uh, Discovery Energy uh, is uh, Discovery Green, sorry Discovery Green, uh, and and what they bring to the table in terms of their relationship with the off takers, customers, people who they do business with already in the uh, banking, in the uh, you know, pension, uh, medical aid, uh, insurance sectors, they have these relationships, a lot of relationships, corporate relationships with a lot of blue chip and uh, you know other uh, corporate entities and business entities and i think this relationship is quite critical uh, because as i talk, said before the key ultimately is this diversified uh, basket of off takers uh, that is the fundamental benefit that a trader can uh, can bring to the, the table and the, the fundamental challenge and of course, uh, you know, technology providers like um, Mezzanine, who, um, uh, you know, you know who, who provide the platforms and this digitization process that en en enable these uh, complex financial transactions to take place seamlessly. Um, of course, there are a number of questions that have arisen, uh, and uh, those are going to be dealt with in the Q&A. But for now, I'd like to introduce uh, Lindsay Dyer. Uh, who uh, is going to do a kind of a overview and summary of what has been heard uh, and provide some of her own insights uh, to what she's heard. So Lindsay uh, has extensive experience in African infrastructure development, mainly focused in the energy sector of Southern Africa. She invests herself as a company, her company in renewable energy solutions in support of Africa's lifeblood, what she sees as small and medium enterprises. And starting as a hydropower engineer, uh, she has worked primarily with infrastructure-focused public and private sector clients at municipal, national, and continental level, as well as in the mining industry in 42 countries of the world, 34 of which are in Africa. Uh, she is a business and community leader, having served on and or chaired the boards of different business chambers, uh, as well as a significant nonprofit organization as well as her own companies. And Lindsay has uh, called South Africa her home for the last 26 years, originally uh, Canadian. Uh, so uh, great to have you as a long-standing, uh, committed uh, South African and African individual, uh, Lindsay. So I'd like to now hand over to you uh, to give your uh, summary and, 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 and your views on what you've heard. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks so much, Chris. This was such an exciting series of presentations because, as you said, it gives an overview from uh, from the perspective of the consumers as well as the generators, and now these new players, uh, those those who are seeking to help the generators and consumers create a genuine ecosystem, a genuine power market in South Africa. And although we didn't touch on it, and I hope it does come up in the questions, uh, in Southern Africa, not just South Africa. Africa. And I think our previous webinar touched on the, the regional potential as well. So I'll, I'll dive into a quick summary of each presentation just for, for those whose note-taking capabilities are uh, were hampered by the interest of listening to the presenters. Um, just briefly an overview of the three presentations then. Andre Nepkin, who's head of Discovery Green, uh, which as you know, is part of the Discovery Group. He shared Discovery's journey into green. He presented on solutions for demand-based based approach to renewable energy wheeling. 
And uh, you would have picked up that they launched Discovery Green on the 6th of September, and it's already signing up customers. This approach, uh, a, a platform-based approach, enables companies to achieve a high renewable energy percentage at a saving while leveraging the risk mitigation benefits of a diversified platform. Now, that was followed by Mezzanine. Jacques Defoss, its CEO, um, presented the, their focus on digital solutions for companies doing business in Africa. And uh, the, the map of Africa that he presented was quite interesting in that uh, it was, it was um, quite heavily dotted on the east, uh, eastern seaboard. And it looks like there's quite a lot of potential for development in West Africa and Central Africa. Now, this digital platform they've developed enables virtual wheeling, and uh, and I'll do a little bit of a deeper dive in a second on uh, on some of the detail that Shark presented. And, uh, and then finally, a very, very interesting from a large scale, um, long standing and truly South African IPP, which is, has now attracted global uh, in investment interest. Um, they're a strategic equity investor. They focus on wind, solar, uh, solar PV and battery energy storage technologies. So he, he gave a, a brief and very comprehensive overview of how um, renewable energy generation can be expanded through arrangements that go beyond the traditional one-to-one -one arrangement. So deeper dive now into Discovery Green's presentation. Uh, they um, essentially the, for me, the crux of, uh, of, of uh, Andre's presentation was that um, they're focusing on uh, energy as a platform versus the traditional share of plant model. And for those who were on the previous webinar, you would have seen an excellent presentation by one of the presenters on, on, uh, on quite a bit of detail on how the share of plant model doesn't work. I think Andre summarized it masterfully. Um, essentially started out by by sharing Discovery's journey into the market. Uh, leading up to this webinar, I saw a lot of questions about what on earth is Discovery, a medical aid provider, doing in, uh, in electricity trading? Um, but fundamentally, their journey started five years ago because they were focusing on how to reduce their emissions, and they quickly realized, uh-oh, uh, we can't do it alone because most of our emissions actually come from so-called scope two emissions, 92% in fact, and they come from the electricity that they buy. Uh, then, uh, then he moved into the, um, uh, the, the benefits of the platform that they developed through, uh, through an actuarial um, engagement, actuarial process, and, uh, and their own business acumen. The, the platform that they've dis developed, Discovery Green, uh, their, their uh, key pillars were that it was to be affordable, renewable, price certain, support the national shortfall, and eliminate this difficulty in contracting, these long-term PPA negotiations. So, so it incorporates seamless onboarding. And, uh, and then fundamentally, to get business businesses running on a hundred percent renewable energy, um, going back to that uh, that shared share of plant model, he's uh, he's emphasized through some really good illustrations just how it's inadequate. Therefore, the aggregation model that they're using in Discovery Green works on the basis of diversification in generation and consumption. We saw that theme across the three presentations based on, as I said before, an actuarial model. It maximizes the amount of renewable energy provided while minimizing the risk faced by businesses. He gave a couple of examples. The gym example I thought was very illustrative, as well as the manufacturing industry example that, that paired a manufacturer that goes uh, essentially that's in operation essentially up to mid-December and goes uh, goes fallow over the holiday period until mid-January. Meanwhile, the hotels are all really active during that fallow period for the manufacturer. So the platform model targets demand and uh, the their products um, that they, they're offering, if I got it correct, two products at the moment, I stand to be corrected, Andre, one which is the, the basic platform model and one more bespoke model, which guarantees 100% availability to the customer. 
And he closed out by saying, why start today? Well, because there are cost benefits from starting today. Moving into Jacques' presentation, um, thank you for that fantastic intro to mezzanine. I think you're, you're right, many of us don't know much about mezzanine, but uh, as Chris emphasized in his, his summaries at the end of each presentation, uh, very much leveraging the use of data for business solutions. So what stood out for me is that they're seeking last mile impact to 65 million people, more or less in, in Africa, although the company's footprint is global. He also shared Vodacom's journey to zero. That seems to be a, a, a theme that's, that's emerging for many players in this space. And it, it, it got into the, the challenges of why traditional wheeling really doesn't, doesn't work anymore. Uh, it might contribute to a percentage of uh, customers' net zero goals, but those are mainly high voltage and, and medium voltage customers. And that doesn't really help SMEs or uh, goodness gracious, residential customers. Um, it was uh, it was emphasized then that virtual wheeling has been approved as policy so that now uh, mezzanine is proving that policy. For, for them, the key question is how to bring the Munichs in, because that's that's where most consumers sit. 80% of, uh, of distribution customers sit in municipalities which buy their electricity from Eskom, whereas the, the remaining 20% of, of customers sit on Eskom distribution networks. But, um, but those municipal electricity distributors, many of them sit in uncreditworthy municipalities. So um, a key a key of the the model that uh, the mezzanine is looking at is, um, is looking at decentralized uh, decentralization on the consumption side and centralization on the recon side uh, at uh, at the Eskom level. We've uh, we've heard quite a bit about the uh, the virtual wheeling mechanism, and I think I might have been speaking a bit to people who were on the previous webinar. So apologies. Virtual wheeling being a recon mechanism, not a credit mechanism, the way that uh, that that uh, traditional wheeling was set up. So with the virtual we wheeling mechanism, really no electrons are harmed in the process. It's a financial mechanism. It's a, it's, it's a, a reconciliation mechanism that, that neatly sidesteps the municipality from, uh, from a contractual arrangement perspective, but at the same time actually opens up possibilities for them from, uh, from Mezzanine's perspective to, uh, to, if not regain uh, customers lost through the uh, uh, what what we call the SSEG rollout, the the um, small scale embedded generation or household low scale commercial uh, rollout of solar PV, um, municipalities are losing that revenue, and uh, Vodacom and Me uh, Mezzanine recognize that this is a serious issue. So. Uh, they decided to co-create this virtual wheeling mechanism with Eskom. One of the key principles of it is that um, the generation must not exceed consumption across all their sites. And uh, therefore, the refund for the, the lower of the, the wheeled energy or what is the refund is for the lower of either the wheeled energy or what is consumed. The, and uh, I'm going to emphasize Eskom refunds the buyer for an overpayment of what they, they paid an independent power producer who they would have uh, contracted with possibly directly or through a trader, perhaps, uh, as per the power purchase agreement. And they also pay the Munich. So there's lots of payment mechanisms involved and contractual arrangements. And I'm going to get to that uh, in a sec, because uh, Jacques put up a really good slide that showed what's in place already and what's new. So the contractual framework, um, essentially there already is a pro forma a version available from Eskom. It, uh, it captures what is already business as usual on the municipal level, as well as business as usual between Eskom and the IPPs. There are a number of new arrangements 
for ESCOM virtual wheeling for the, ES the, the virtual wheeling platform and quite important, the ESCOM approved smart metering service providers. So any business looking to get into this space is going to have to get clued up on those, uh, those service providers. So in conclusion, the virtual wheeling value proposition, say mezzanine, is a value to the entire uh, uh, the, the entire ecosystem of ESCOM, independent power producers, traders, private enterprise, and importantly, the municipalities. And not just the municipalities, but uh, uh, those, those that they consider tenants within the municipalities because it can offer green credentials to them. Now, um, the, the final presentation, Jan Oberholzer, chairman of Molino, extremely interesting from a, a large IPP perspective. So uh, he outlined, for those who might not have been familiar, the key power purchase considerations for an IPP after giving a comprehensive overview of Molino. It's big. Uh, it's got a pipeline of about seven gigawatts of uh, wind and about 23 gigawatts of solar and battery energy storage and um, 420 megawatts of operational assets and 410 megawatts uh, of, of uh, projects with PPAs signed. So they've got experience developing PPAs. So very briefly then the one-to-one, one-to-many -one, one -many, and one-to-one-to-many -one -to -many arrangement, which is where traders come into play. What were the trader benefits to an IPP? Um, it can bring in additional small customers. It can bring in access to municipal customers. The, the role of the municipality is, is highlighted again. And um, it also brings risk mitigation. Finally, the key considerations for an IPP contracting with a trader, um, the, advantage are, the advantages are trader bankability and uh, the ability of the trader to find customers and the, 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 the flexibility on PPA structure with the trader. So uh, Jan concluded by saying traders will definitely form part of Mulilo's offtake strategy. Thanks all, looking forward to the Q&A session. Thank you indeed, Lindsay, for that um, overview. And um, yeah, as you say, uh, it's good to have this kind of a summary because uh, a lot is being thrown at us in these presentations. Uh, there's a yeah. lot to digest. Yeah. And uh, it's sometimes uh, I find it very really useful to have this kind of a summary um, afterwards to just recap uh, what was said and, uh, and the important takeaways that you, you, you identified. So thank you. Uh, very, very much for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we've had a total, I see, of about uh, 50, um, 50 questions, just over 50 questions. And I have asked the members of the panel, um, who I'm now going to ask to please switch on your cameras uh, so that we can see you, um, as we handle the Q&A session. Um, and, uh, and 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 uh, both Lindsay and I will kind of throw some questions at you now. Amongst the fifty or so questions, um, uh, twenty-eight have been answered uh, in one form or no another. I have asked um, the presenters while the presentations are in progress to try and answer some of these questions because we can't get through all fifty, uh, you know, in the Q and A session. And uh, so I'm, I'm also going to have to. There is quite a bit of duplication of questions, overlap, etc. So I'm not going to necessarily identify you know, and, and run through this one by one, uh, giving the name of the questioner and reading out his question and asking for an answer, but to try and group them in some sort of themes uh, to avoid these overlaps. Uh, and if I may, Lindsay, kick off uh, by asking the first question. And, and um, so many questions have been asked um, and so I'm going to try and summarize them uh, in, in, in this one question and this this risk of the of the municipalities being in good standing uh, you know there were questions about what percentage of municipalities are in good standing uh, will there be is there transparency do we know which municipalities are in good standing and which are not in good standing and um, and and uh, uh, and, and and what about changes in good standing? Uh, you know, uh, uh, the Munich might be in good standing now, uh, but uh, there is a risk that it might be changing, and uh, uh, customers don't know 
you know, that their municipality, you know, is on the verge of not being in good standing. Um, and, and, and so the question of transparency towards customers uh, when they are signing these sort of agreements uh, as to uh, these municipalities, um, uh, how is this being addressed uh, by um, traders like Discovery Green? Uh, and how how does the uh, you know the platform that Jacques talks about uh, deal with, with this? So this whole question of municipal risk, and while we add it, there's a whole question. There are questions about Eskom's financial risk. Uh, you know, is Eskom a credit risk uh, going forward in this new world? Uh, you know, we've seen changes in management and even at the chairman level, <laughs> at the COO level and the CEO level, uh, it's uh, quite an uncertain environment. And how, how credit worthy is Eskom going forward? Because ultimately Eskom's credit worthy is critical on this. And I know that there is work being done on this. And, and certainly, by the way, if anybody wants to put up their hand, you know, from people who are dealing with this credit risk of municipality and credit risk of Eskom and how to make virtual trading a bit more secure against these credit risks. Uh, you know, I'm talking about people like Meridian Economics, who I know have been doing work in this field. Uh, if they would want to put up their hand and give us some indication of the latest thinking, please be my guest. But uh, can I throw this first of all at you, Andre? Uh, you know, how, how how transparent are you with your potential customers on the risks of credit risks of municipalities and Eskom? Thank you. So, so Jock can probably is probably the best person to ask this, but I'll I'll give you our opinion on it. Um, I think I think the the approach to it is is you can be smart about it uh, around that. Of course, uh, if you uh, if you approach this from a basis that that you're in a municipality where um, or you're willing to put through a particular municipality which might be in a bit of a gray area on that, I mean, that is a risk that you're taking on. But I think the, the way that Jock explained the mechanism, I think, is, is quite smart in that, is that if you have enough in the green section, almost together, you you are protecting yourselves. And it's, it's very much about design and product around that because not taking, you know, I think there's a, it's, it's a risk reward sort of situation. You've got to decide how much you want to take and how much you want to do. And, and I think there's a point at which it makes complete sense uh, on that. And then, uh, and then on your, and, and Jock can, can comment a little bit, a little bit more on that. The, the, the second one around, around ESCOM and, and the credit worthiness, I think, you know, it's a, maybe a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy then if you don't take a view on it and don't take a little bit of risk on it, because the, the alternative is probably worse where you say, listen, we're not going to take that risk. We're not going to do virtual wheeling. And hence, we're not going to build renewable energy generation plants. And hence, load shedding is going to continue. Hence, there's going to be a shortfall. You know, the the counter to me is actually a little bit more scary than actually the the, the taking the chance. I think we need to be pragmatic, uh, need to be smart about it and and lean it into it the right way. But, but you know, the, the solve out of it as opposed to avoid it. I think is is the is the right approach here, yeah, in my opinion. Thank you, thank, thanks, Andre. Uh, Jacques, please come in here and give your uh, input if you have any. Yeah, no, thanks, um, Chris. I think first and foremost, I mean, we have highlighted the, the the Munich risk, and I think we need to acknowledge. The current standing is probably deteriorating in the short term with respect to percentage of Munich that's not in good standing. And then this should be a concern to all of us, irrespective of which mechanism is at play with respect to the recovery. But I think if we look at the design and the objectives, and again, a lot of credit to the ESCOM stakeholders that was key in, 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 in de designing the mechanism. Ultimately, this is a means for ESCOM to offload investment in generation capacity to private sector balance sheet. So, and I don't, I don't want to comment. I mean, with authority like Jan on 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 on, the, on this forum, on the specifics around the unbundling, but this mechanism will fall under the transmission distribution component, not under generation. So the benefit for ESCOM is I get to improve my which is currently supply constrained generation capacity uh, in the country by leveraging third party or private sector balance sheets. So that's the that's the upside with respect to investing in the generation capacity. 
With respect to the recovery, in other words, what is what is the return? So I get the net zero benefit as a buyer, which I've highlighted, but over and above that, the fact that I'm out of pocket, both paying the IPP and the Munich, the cash flow with respect to funding this transaction is ultimately backed by the buyer. Now, the question is, how do we get the Munichs to pay ESCOM what is due to ESCOM? And I think there's a lot of considerations currently being discussed and tabled on an ECOM secretariat level. And I think as a collective, there's a lot of stakeholders in looking at means to support municipalities in improving their standing. But I think what is important to note, the alternative is embedded generation, which is directly impacting Munich revenue, where they fulfill the role of a distributor. Now, this is a is alternative, again, that they can offer to their tenants Start with your multinationals, your large enterprises, your listed companies, but on a principle down to a residential level to say, I can give you that green credential. This is not solving for load shedding. I think it's an issue, an item I've not raised earlier. So virtual wheeling will not solve load shedding in the short term. What it will solve for is increasing generation capacity, which will over time rise the tide and hopefully decrease the current supply constraint that, we, that we're dealing with. So I think mitigation is is let's make the Munich a party to this transaction. Let's let's get them to share the benefit and and support them in recovering their revenue. Because if you look on a see through principle, and we talk about transparency, and I'll comment on the actual visibility on standing data in a moment. But and this is the beauty of technology. We now can enable Munich also to recover revenue and to optimize revenue collection. Because we have last mile visibility, so we can hold each and every stakeholder accountable throughout the energy value chain, including transmission distribution. I think third bullet point, I don't want to comment on ESCOM's balance sheet and with respect to will they be good for their money. The fact that it's from an accounting point of view, refund on overpayment again, that transaction has been funded by the, by the buyer in paying both the Munich and the IPP. Um, and then just a last item with respect to uh, the, the Munich risk. Informing the buying decision, I think this is the point Andre made, is I need to look at my energy profile, and I've shared the Vodacom map, but each profile for each buyer is unique. If we take a ShopRite or FNB or uh, uh, Steers, for example, will be unique. And that need to be overlaid with your Munich, let's say, historic standing data. So from a poppy point of view, there's a lot of sensitivity around sharing the, this information. So it will be managed aligned with the regulatory requirements. Um, but informing the buying decision will say, and this is why traders is so important, and to Jan's point, traders will be ag able to aggregate demand across, let's call it your tier four, five, and six buyers, your smaller buyers, low and medium voltage buyers. And then contract that demand and get the economy of scale benefit on this on the generation side. Now, part of that aggregation role will be to blend. And I mean, Andre, your slide was great. Pharmacy versus gym versus ATM versus Vodacom. If you blend these profiles, you can get a better profile with respect to meeting the supply profile that we can support in South Africa. And this is our endowment as a country. We have a great resource, both in sun and wind and I believe in hydrogen and other technologies going forward. So I think the trader will support in aggregating demand and in doing that also blend the Munich risk, which ultimately means all of us will only be able to recover a percentage of our demand through this mechanism. So we will not get to 100% through virtual wheeling, but if we can get to 50%, if we can get to 60%, across our JSE top 100 companies, and we leverage that 60% balance sheet, that is solving for a material supply constraint that we currently have from a quantum point of Jacques, view. Yeah, Jacques, I'm, I'm <clears throat> going to cut you here. Um, we've got a lot of questions to get through, and I think um, right, uh, you've given a very clear view there. And But uh, 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 Lindsay, before I hand over to you with, with, for a question, I do want to take a, a question, or shall we say a response from Javier Stein from Meridian Economics, who has put up his hand, and I've now allowed him to talk. I know that Meridian is doing a lot of work in taking this virtual wheeling even further than it is at the moment to address these risks of Eskim and uh, municipal uh, you know, good standing. Uh, so I'd like to ask uh, um, 
uh, Hrovia, please come in here, Hrovia, and tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing. Good afternoon, Chris. Can I just check that you can hear me? Yes, we can. Loud and clear. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks for organizing this event. And very much thanks to the presenters. It's really um, very encouraging to see all these different players working very hard to find find the solutions that we need in this country in our in our power sector. So that, that's really very encouraging. Um, I, I, I know time is limited, so I'm going to go very quickly through some of my thoughts. Um, so my the focus of my comments is not on the actual business models of the aggregators or traders. So that's obviously a very exciting business models, but I'm not commenting on that. I'm commenting on this underlying question about how the how the wheeling can work and how, how we can make that work best. So, of course, I, I posted that point about the credit risk and we're all talking about it. Um, so I think my, my main point is that we, we, we currently have two different wheeling models. Um, I, we, we think that they are uh, they, they're great. It's a lot of good in, in innovative thinking there. But unfortunately, uh, we think they're still quite limited in their reach. And if you think about the nature of our load shedding crisis, the nature of our decarbonization crisis, as Andre pointed out, given the carbon intensity of our electricity, we haven't. We, we we are going to have to rely hugely on private sector investment and generation to get this country through these enormous challenges. So we need to find ways of making this wheeling system work incredibly well. So of course the conventional wheeling model. Uh, I, I think you pointed out some of the challenges there around practicality, the implementation risk. You have to go into the municipal billing systems, ESCOM billing system. The, the regulatory issues that are very inflexible and the reporting requirements, et cetera. It's not a very efficient system. And it, of course, uh, makes it hard to, to buy all the power that you need and because it's hard to replace the power somewhere else if you don't need it. On the virtual wheeling side, it's a, a really encouraging in, innovation. Um, but uh, the, and, and it's, it's, it solves the, 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 the distributor and the billing system uh, problem entirely. And so you can avoid you know, implementing it in the municipal areas. You can essentially bypass them. But of course, it's got a big problem. And that is that you are exposed to serial credit risk, right? So both the municipal risk, as we were talking about, and then also ESCOM risk. We must remember that... Um, uh, ESCOM is not accredited with the counterparty, and and any all the IPPs we've seen in this country that sell to ESCOM, of course, have government guarantees uh, uh, backing up their payment. So we we uh, and we 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 just think that ult ultimately, even though the buyer can uh, obviously it's the buyer that's um, taking that risk, not the IPP itself. But ultimately, if buyers are going to be buying a lot of power, the banks that are financing the IPPs. Uh, will need to know that the whole system is viable and is not going to collapse once ESCOM. Because if, if ESCOM defaults for any reason, it, it could be quite a big, quite a big event. So we were trying to, we were we grappling with this question and can we make some further tweaks to to the particularly to the virtual wheeling system? And of course, the big problem with it is is that there's at least in the in the first step, there's a double payment for power. Right, the buyer pays the IPP and the off-taker pays the full municipal bill. And that's why it creates this payment risk, which where, where you are dependent on that refund ultimately coming back to, to you via the municipality via ESCOM. So of course, the um uh, the, the big issue here is uh well, can you avoid uh, can you avoid doing that double payment if you can avoid putting the cash into the municipality's hands and then waiting for it to go through the municipality through ESCOM and then back to you, you've really solved a big part of the problem. So we've essentially conceived uh, of this idea that we can, uh, it's maybe you can think of it as a bit of a hybrid between the two systems, that we can de develop a tradable credit uh, token system, which uh, complies entirely with all of the ESCOM gen wheeling rules. Uh, and that the idea is that these tokens are, are not claims to electricity, they are financial instruments that are claims to a credit on an electricity account. So it's essentially the idea that that you will uh, you can use those tokens as payment or as, as a credit to, to achieve to obtain a credit on your municipal account and in turn the municipalities can use the same tokens to obtain a, a credit uh, on the ESCOM bulk accounts. And then, of course, ESCOM can just, the, 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 the story ends there because the power has been injected onto ESCOM's um, uh, grid. They, they benefit from the power being there and the, the, the power has been uh, 
associated with the with the customers in the municipal area for whom they just just given a token. So this is uh, I'm not explaining it very well now. We'll be publishing our paper in the next two weeks that explains the whole concept in a, in a lot of detail. But what we want to say is that this has a potentially a lot of benefits. It will create a highly liquid market for adjusting positions before you have to pay your account. So it will make uh, therefore it will make it possible to buy 100% power if you want to. Because if you're going to be over or under, you, you'll have some uh, a, a good few weeks to re to readjust your position because tokens are will be will be tradable. It will also substantially de-risk therefore the power procurement for for the customers or the procurement of tokens at least. Because um, it's you, you can you can do something with it if you, if you if you don't need it or at least the buyer can do it on your behalf as well and therefore if you de-risk the financial commitments for the buyers you are so, because it's now there's a liquid market you are also de-risking it for the investors in the gener in generation plant which unlocks much greater investment gener in generation so um, I'm trying to maybe end this quickly but. Um, uh, let's say uh, the, the key issue, the, the, what, what it will require, a, a downside, is that you will have to implement tokens, not in the billing system, but as payments in effect on the municipal accounts and on the ESCOM accounts. But of course, every single municipality in this, count, in this country is able to receive payments. They receive payments today, even the ones that are defaulting on their, on their ESCOM bulk accounts. So it's not a new thing. Uh, and all of this can be done in the same way that the virtual wheeling platform will be sharing data with ESCOM and, and, and with other players in the, in the existing proposal of the system. So overall, we, we think that this will be an um, uh, important game changer. And I think it can be a game changer for the system to unlock much greater investment in generation resources and storage resources. And it's going to be critical both for decarbonization and for helping us resolve load, load shedding sooner. Thank you. Thank you, Kruvia. Thank you very much for those insights. We're looking forward to, uh, with anticipation uh, to your papers or your reports and studies uh, in this regard and proposals. Uh, I think, uh, you, you know, it's a it's an evolutionary process, uh, you know, on dealing with a complex problem. And um, I, we've, you know, it has been identified this credit risk uh, issue uh, and, and the double payment issue. And, and so uh, we look forward to any positive uh, solutions that can drive this process forward. So thank you very much. So with that, I'm going to hand over now to Lindsay to ask a question. I'm sorry it was a, it took such a long time, but I think it, it was a question that came up so many times in the Q&A. So over to you, Lindsay, for your next one. No, thanks very much. And I'm going to uh, pick out a question which takes a different tack. It's looking at the regulation aspect of all of this. And it's a little bit provocative. It says, uh, it's from uh, Tutu Benya. If there will be competition at generation and retail levels, how long will the phasing out of regulation by NURSA out of the retail and generation businesses take? Essentially, let's rephrase the question. And, uh, and they, uh, Tutu asked a, a follow-up question farther down. Uh, on the role of the system operator. What's the role of the regulator in this new space? And uh, I suppose let's address this to Andre to start out and, uh, and then possibly Jacques. Lindsay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to rephrase that question just a little bit. I'm just trying to make sure I answer it correctly. I'm, uh... Well, what, what will the future role of NURSA be? I'm, I'm paraphrasing Tutu's question now. What will the future role of NURSA be with respect to regulating traders in, in essentially uh, a competitive market? Yeah, and may I add a question that I also saw on the subject, and that is, how far is Discovery Green in getting its trading license? Uh, and and, and uh, what is the role of the regulator in getting such a license? Thanks. Sure. So, so and quickly just to answer that question, yes, uh, we have applied uh, a while ago for a license and in the process and active discussions on that. And uh, I can't really comment on on that process right now, but it is a it is a rigorous uh, rigorous process. On the on the role of the the regulator within this market, I actually don't see a uh, a it becoming less of a role, actually, probably more of a role in terms of issuing licenses, in terms of monitoring prices, in uh, monitoring people taking advantage. You know, I think there's there's probably a, a be be an increasing role. I think the question that was probably 
the, the part of the question is probably aimed at is, is around price regulation and where things can go, you know, uh, and around that. I think at this point in time, given given where, uh, I think it, it becomes an issue for regulation if it goes above what ESCOM is currently offering, what the regulated price is. I think it's less of an issue if you can offer it at a cheaper rate. But how the market evolves, we're going to have to see. Um, and uh, but I but uh, I can't in, I can't imagine a world without without some oversight um, for the industry in this space. Thanks, Jock, Do you want to come uh, in, or Jan? Would you? Yeah, I think let I'll allow Jan to comment. It's probably the one of the most experienced on this topic, and then I'll add just one note. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um... Jacques, uh, I, I tend to agree with uh, Andre was saying, you know, you cannot have an industry without proper governance and to have an eye on exactly what is happening. So in my view, very little to, uh, to add to what, what Andre said, that we definitely need, in my view, somebody that will have an eye to regulate and make sure, you know, things are within, you know, the boundaries that uh, that we need. So I agree with that. Can I quickly just chip in here? Uh, sorry to butt in, but uh, Jan, is is NERSA the, the regulator that you see, uh, or do we need some kind of a financial regulator? I mean, NERSA has its own uh, issues, uh, uh, you know, but, but really is NERSA the regulatory authority or should it be some other regulatory authority? This is why I'm saying, uh, Chris, uh, I don't know. I don't know how, you know, this crystal ball looks in the future, but do we need a regulator? Yes, we do. Is it NERSA the way it is now? I cannot comment on that, but that we need regulation, there is no doubt about it. I believe that a lot of water will still run into the sea, and it may be uh, what you're what you, what you, what you actually focusing on. It may not be the NERSA, it, and I think it, you're right, it will not be the NERSA as we know it today into the future for what, those, what the focus will be. Yeah, that's my view as well. Yeah. Sure. Chris, just to add um, to to on the one thing that we need to consider is if we use private sector um, balance sheet to invest in generation capacity, that is a ten plus year commitment. Um, let's say twenty year time horizon. Currently, the the, the refund is WEPS X losses. So that's a wholesale energy <clears throat> pricing schedule X losses, which is a NERSA uh, tariff, and it's determined on it for for twelve month period. Uh, as a buyer, I can't now. If you look at the historic trend, it's as Andre said earlier, it's it's consumer price inflation plus X percent. Um, so in theory, you should never be under the water once you've contracted. But practically speaking, if there's excess generation or supply, then you might face a future scenario of being under the water. So I think whether they need to be a regulator, absolutely. From a planning, from a pricing point of view, no question, no question on that. Should we take a longer time horizon with respect to determining a refund? Because refund is ultimately the cost of generation. So what is the cost of generation for a kilowatt hour in South Africa for the next 12 months? Blended across all electron types. We should take a bit of a longer view as a regulator in order to give the buyer the confidence that I can make my balance sheet available for that investment. So that's my be a requirement. Who will take up the responsibility? Uh, I don't want to comment on that. Um, but I think we need to look at a longer time horizon with respect to the refund um, pricing. Thank you. Lindsay, please, can you go ahead with another question before I come in with mine? I think I've had said too much already. Thanks. Well, well, I'm going to cheat and ask one of mine, but uh, but let me uh, let me just uh, pick up on Chris Joubert's question. In Europe and the US, there's a notion that long duration, i.e. large capacity energy storage is essential to reach net zero. We know this comes at a cost, but also that working at 20 year PPAs is a lot more sensible. OK, well, I think we've we've dealt with that extensively in this webinar. Would you consider taking on long duration batteries such as flow batteries in storage as a service model within your wheeling systems? I think that's initially directed at Andre, but it'd be interesting to get a view from Jan. Sure, I'll, I'll give a quick response. I think I think, yes, it is a, as an absolute role. Yeah, I think 
Um, it depends on who you're dealing with and who you have the conversation with. I think what we found is that, you know, if you if you have the conversation with those and responsible for ESG, the answer is absolutely. If you have the answer the conversation with the CFO, the answer is hang on. Um, let's let's see how this goes. And I think it it all just depends on on those narratives. And I think when the pressure is right, um, it will definitely be a consideration. Okay, thanks, Jan. Would you like to weigh in? Yeah, I can. You know, a lot of people, I believe, confuse us going green with only renewables. The way we we talk about it now, it's wind and solar. And I don't believe that that is the solution. I also don't believe that there's a good understanding currently in our country what the demand and the profile should be a 24-hour profile going forward uh, into the future, you know, having short-term focus, medium as well as long-term. So that is critical that we fully understand what the demand is going to be and what the profile is going to be in time to come and have a long-term view. And I understand that the longer you go, the more hazy it becomes. And I fully understand it, but at least have a view. And then it's critical to understand what you have, what is coming to end of life, and then be very clear what hybrid solution do you require. And is pump storage part of that? There is no doubt in my mind that it has to be. Yes, uh, Andre is, is correct. You know, the CFO will say, is, what is the CAPEX going to be for this, for this project? How long is it going to take, etc." So, But for me, that is definitely part of the hybrid solution. Then also, if you look at the system operator, in terms of ensuring the integrity of the system, you know, when you have some challenges uh, in terms of your generation performance, having pump storage available definitely is a huge, huge advantage. Thanks. Uh, uh, Chris, I'm going to sneak my question in before you, yes, you ask yours. Thank you. Uh, and Thank you. and that, that goes to the promise of this webinar, that, uh, that we'd be looking at mechanisms for how SMEs and residential customers would be able to, uh, to, to benefit from trading. And uh, the presenters have all touched on this, but, but my question goes to the, the practical roadmap and timelines that they can anticipate. How would Joe Q municipal resident um, put up his hand and say, hey, I, I want to benefit from uh, from virtual wheeling and the rollout of traders and this fantastic new ecosystem. And how would SMEs in South Africa, but ultimately Southern Africa, how would they benefit from the advent of traders in, in this new no, expanding if I may come, ecosystem? If I may come in and say, uh, you know, when will Discovery Vitality members uh, be able to start buying a uh, green energy uh, through the discovery platform <laughs> just to throw it in okay so so i i leave it up to um the presenters to decide who i suspect jacques you you might want to answer this one first um i will refer <laughs> to Jan and to andre but i think it i mean the question is just underlining the importance of the role of the trader. So ultimately, from an administrative overhead point of view, and we tier the buyer. So if tier one is your smelters, your high voltage, large quantity, down to tier six, which is, let's call it residential, single-owned businesses, SMEs. Um, so the role of the aggregator across these tiers is absolutely critical. And these are almost different segments of the market that will be serviced. Um, I've, I think from a timing point of view, it, it will be evolution. So your mm -hmm. JC listed companies that's got a strong balance sheet will probably move quicker than a trader that need to take some level of risk on behalf of the aggregate. Uh, but again, uh, Jan, I think you and, and Andre is probably better positioned. From my side, you know, from an IPP point of view, I will comment my views. Um, if you can remember one of my, I think it was the last slide where we were talking about uh, the special purpose vehicle to a an ESCOM, to perhaps some large customers, some medium-sized customers. But when you talk about small customers, typically you would like to see the trader in between, that you have the PPA with the trader and that the trader then will have the independent, you know, or will have then the, the, the PPA with whichever customers. So that's the way we see it, and that's the way I see it currently. So, Andre, I don't know what, how you want to comment as a trader uh, on this question that was posed. 
Uh, thanks, Jan. I think um, I won't I won't comment on the future of vitality members and green energy at this point in time. We'll see how that that sort of plays out. But a few, just a few points from me. I think I think there's a couple of hurdles that need to be overcome for order to that to happen. And I think we're ticking those off a lot of it today as well. I think one, the framework, uh, and I think Jacques presented on that. You know, the there's no there's no obvious reason why residential is not an option under that framework at this point in time. I think the second hurdle is, of course, accuracy and metering and data. Um, and I'm sure, you know, you, we all know that residential suffers from very inaccurate metering or very infrequent metering. So that is a that is a hurdle that needs to 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 be overcome. And then then the third one, um, I think, is 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 probably a more important one is, is someone has to take risk on it, I believe. Someone has to take a chance because you cannot ask for termination penalties and liquidity deposits from retail customers. You don't have that level of security or balance sheet available to you. And someone has to have ability to do that. So uh, is there a future of that? I think yes. Um, is there a long way to go? Yes. Thanks. Um, we kind of have reached two o'clock. Uh, it's gone so quickly, it's unbelievable. Uh, but I would like to put in a last question uh, under the formal proceedings and we'll then bring the formal proceedings to a close. And I hope some of our presenters will stay on for some of the inf informal discussions that will take place uh, uh, thereafter. But if I can now sneak in a last question, it has been raised by a whole uh, a range of people. Uh, and, and that is the question of the uh, uh, tariff structure, ESCOM's tariff structure and its balance between fixed uh, tariffs and, and variable, uh, the fixed and variable components. In other words, the the capacity component and, and the provision thereof and, and the energy component, which is the variable part. What is the risk of this? And uh, and, and how, how is, uh, how do you address this risk of potential changes, uh, you know, at this level uh, throughout this, the structure of ESCOM uh, and, and, and how is this taken into account? And, and if I can just check in this one to, to, to Jan probably, and that is, uh, what are the grid constraints uh, to developers such as Molilo, you know, looking at trading and in conventional uh, wheeling arrangements, um, you know, wh wh what are the grid constraints uh, to your business plans? Uh, so maybe we can start off with... Um, uh, with, with Andre on, 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 on the first part and then uh, uh, Jan on the second part. Sure. So so on the tariffs, I think it is it is a substantial risk, but it's also, you know, a risk that that you can only have a voice on really if you do, or if you're exposed to that risk. And I think that's sort of proportional on that. So uh, I think there's ways to mitigate and manage that. I think the first one that you have available to you is that um, that your price of generation cost is lower than the current price. So there is a little bit of a delta or a margin there in which to, to um, you know, uh, balance out or handle some of these risks that do go away. But could it go completely in the opposite direction? I think um, I think that that is a risk and, and hopefully there's enough voices here to to flag that as a, as a potential down, downside to the industry before it happens. Thanks, uh, Andre. Yes, you wouldn't believe me, but I wanted to end with exactly what you've asked now is I believe it warrants a webinar from yourself to discuss the issue. You know, we, we're talking about generating electrons. We're talking about all the process to get it to the customer. But the issue is how are we going to get it there? And I believe it's a significant challenge that we have in the country that is not receiving, in my view, the attention it requires. Um, you know, by 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 talking about a lack of capacity and not in the same breath talk about how do you get those electrons that you generate to the load centers where it's required i think is missing the point and i believe it may be one of the biggest risks that we have in the country and that is how do we get the electrons to the load centers now i had a um a session on friday um you know with pulasa now, Pulasa basically is, uh, you know, a, 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 a body. Let me just quickly check. It is the Power Operations and Leadership Association of South Africa. So they're looking at uh, basically uh, the power lines and, uh, you know, uh, other infrastructure. Um, so 
I don't believe that we have even close sufficient capacity. You know, we can talk about curtailment, we can talk about a lot of things, but I believe it's band-aids that we are putting on. It is really time that we understand together, this crystal ball that I was talking about, it is looking at demand in the future. Demand is one portion. Part of that demand is what infrastructure is required. Um, so uh, just very just a comment then uh, for your, to answer your question very directly. Do we have sufficient electrical network to take uh, the electrons that is required in this country over the next uh, 10, 15 years? No, I don't believe we have. And as soon, I believe it's critical that we as soon as possible start talking actively what we're going to do. And I also believe, and this is my personal view, that the model that Eskom has been following, you know, for the last how many decades by building and operating it themselves, need to have a different look. And maybe also with the, the balance uh, sheet uh, challenge, it is now time you know, to look at other models on how to quickly roll out uh, the network that is required in the country. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Jan, thank you very much uh, for that. And I think that's a point on which to end the formal proceedings today. And um, I, I mean, it opens up the door and I take up the challenge. I will take up your challenge, Jan. Uh, I have, in fact, been thinking uh, really about this, uh, you know, the distributed energy resources, how to manage it, how to optimize it, how to maximize penetration, you know, even down to the municipal level where there's uh, residential uh, rooftops, so the PV and battery storage, uh, there will be problems emerging, but these things can be managed. There are tools available, uh, like software tools uh, that would really appeal to Jacques. Uh, you know, to manage these distributed uh, energy resources is right down to the domestic level. So I, I think this last mile is important. I think the national grid is important. Uh, and, and I take up the challenge. And this is not the last webinar on, on the subject, I can assure you. Uh, so with that, I'd like to, first of all, thank um, presenters, um, uh, Andre, uh, 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 Jacques and Jan for the, the effort they put in for the really interesting presentations they've given. Uh, and for the insights they bring and, and, and the experience and the, the knowledge and the solutions that they present to customers. And also to my colleague and friend, Lindsay, thank you very much indeed for uh, helping me out in this uh, webinar. I really appreciate it. Uh, and, and for giving your insights and helping me with a QA. and a uh, It's great to uh, know that one's not alone and <laughs> that one's got some support. Uh, also to my producer behind the scenes who you haven't met yet, and that's Ian Reid. Uh, thanks, Ian, for, for behind the scenes work that you do, uh, also easing the uh, way and getting this out. Um, everybody, uh, thank you for attending. It was great to have you. We've had a fantastic audience. It peaked at about 800 uh, persons uh, and as, as uh, unique uh, attendees today. Um, uh, concurrent uh, presenters, uh, attendees were somewhat less than that, not much less, about 750. Uh, and, and that's a good turnout, an excellent turnout. We will be sending all uh, people that registered to attend this webinar, a feedback report you know, with links to download the presentation as well as to view the uh, video and audio recording of, of this. Uh, and, and this will be made available not only to all that attended, but also to the media uh, to, uh, to make sure that uh, the people in South Africa are informed about these kind of developments. So watch the space for the future developments. I'm sorry we have by far not been able to handle all the questions.